great. We're going to do the speed presentations that we started to do on Wednesday, but this time we have some folks who are ready to go. And um, I want to bring out my partner in crime here, Ryan Locke, who is, uh, as I told you before, my PhD student in, uh, at KTH University and now at the Center for the Future of Places. And I'm pleased to report that he has recovered from his Johnson & Johnson shot. <laughs> I think you've made me famous for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right, because you were the poster child for getting the vaccine for free uh, as an international arrival. And we haven't had too many of those, unfortunately. So the first one that we're going to introduce, I'm going to set up uh, because he's our good friend, Mark Moreno from Andrews University. And he wasn't traveling internationally, but the university set a policy that they were not allowing travel yet. And that's also been a challenge for a number of our presenters. So um, Mark Moreno will give his presentation. I so love aha moments. They stand out among other things that sustain me as a professor. They connect us with spirited consciousness. They bring joy because they represent meaningful ideas and learning. They inspire people to share their stories. And they're simply fun. Elton John must have had a similar brilliant aha moment to my daughter, Mila, who was three at the time when she held a pair of scissors to her eyes and said, hey, dad, wouldn't it be nice if scissors had eyes? That way they could see what they're doing. And I'm often struck in wonderment by what young people do today. In my work with college students and kids, I'm privileged to provide experiences and witness and encourage freeing explorations in design. In Renaissance, kids were attempting to walk in kids' shoes with loving patience and empathy. Materials and associates create aha moments. Mark, just make it a circle, was a friendly ego slap when Julia noticed my persistent failing attempts to deny this whisper dish its essence. You see, I wanted a triumphal arch, but the dish didn't. In a similar design slash ego problem, I struggled with how to join this, bike's, uh, this bike rack's vertical rods with the ground. And it took my wife to simply ask, doesn't a truss want to hang? Well, duh. Um, and by the way, first graders helped to make the masonry on this project. To listen and empathize, we must let go of some controls. With our goal, Building with kids to build kids up. Surrendering design decisions to college students and to kids became necessary. Gian, a college sophomore, designed the sitting space. This small house was initiated by kids in a local church youth group whose rather overwhelmed leader, because of such a daunting request to build a tiny house for a homeless person, asked if Renaissance kids could help. So taking a can-do attitude with children's imaginings empowered everybody involved in this project. The project, Tiny Houses for Big Change, needed the logo, so 12-year-old Bella made one. Uh, thinking I was going to help because I'm a professional, I embellished her design, to which she said, that's not the logo I designed. Wheelchair-bound Neil inadvertently raised aha consciousness such that this museum built the ramp that you see here. The kids made it a place with pillars and benches, and then Neil revealed how the universal design awareness exhibit inside the museum was itself not accessible. In this full-scale tiny house construction designed again by kids, the aha moment happens when, per plan, the light moved from the kitchen to the dining room and the bell rang when the table folded up in its position for dinner time. The aha moments for this sculpture designed by 13 year old Tristan came 
in the first winter after installation at Cafe Gulistan. The center pole had filled with water and frozen and the top pushed out, damaging it, but we repaired a scrape with a paprika infused patch. Take a picture today, download it to your computer, print it to paper, place it on a light table, trace what you imagine those children could be. This was a 10 minute exercise that would have taken two days when I was in college. Moving the camp online surprisingly did not mean that collaboration would be hindered. We used Zoom and Concept Board to facilitate many joint projects. This one here, a joint lemonade stand where the ideas flowed very well from child to child and from drawing to models. The design for this stage set, Zeppelin, came from a 12 year old Logan. He um, was an amazing inspiration, but one of the major aha moments also was when Nadine, an architecture senior, said, here's how we can attach the fabric with using the screws already there. Ask almost any child what they would do to make this piece of streetscape and property better. And don't lead the witness. They'll tell you trees, flowers, add crosswalks, more buildings, benches, street lights, and such. Their answers never disappoint, and they're often surprising. When a child said, add trees, I said, what do trees give you? And he said, this was Omar, eight years old, they give you oxygen. And I said, I wasn't even thinking about oxygen. I was thinking about shade and beauty. And he said, well, you'd better. And I realized that Omar's trying to save the world, not just the street. But we asked about 200 boys and girls to draw an architect and give the architect a name. How many children would draw a woman architect? Only one boy drew a woman architect. He named her Princess Cheesecake. And so it appears we have more work to do as a society. This space was collaboratively designed and built by consensus with kids ages five to 16. No, really, they listened to the school superintendent's wishes and made all major design decisions. COVID was a global aha, a nightmare, yes, for many, but also an opportunity to dream and to change. I shed my negative bias of remote learning. I've taken to drawing and watercoloring more for fun and I published a children's book with my middle daughter, Sienna. And in closing, I'm reminded of a touching moment between a student and an alumnus. The alumnus asked the student a question with a caring hope that she and all young people will design their own lives for goodness. And I ask of you today, the same question, what is your dream? Okay, next up, I'm pleased to introduce Ethan Kent of Placemaking X. And we've known Ethan for a while. He's been a main collaborator with the Future of Places conference series that, that uh, sort of has led into a lot of this work and, and the creation of the Center for the Future of Places in Stockholm. And without further ado. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Cheers, Ryan. Thank you. This is really special to be a part of and be with all of you. Um, I'm going to talk about how a focus on place and placemaking can be a means to build on and broaden the conversation that, that really IMCL has led for, for decades now. Um, and it's actually particularly meaningful for me to be here because my journey on, in this world actually started at the first IMCL conference. Actually, when I was nine years old, I was, my father took me to Venice to join the first conference, uh, and it was, I remember it all vividly. I remember it was the first time I was able to walk in a city by myself, um, the first time I ever understood what my father did, and um, 
the first time I sort of understood what urbanism was about. And I've been hooked ever since. It's been quite a journey and, I, you know, I, and I've been lucky because of Michael uh, been, being involved with many parts of the journey with him and, and many others here um, to be in a position to sort of connect and, and help grow these efforts with you all. Um, and I'm particularly inspired by being here in Carmel of what, you know, it's really raised the bar on what's possible, what kind of change is possible um, on how leading with livability, but also leading with public space. And um, I want to bring up, and this is all just sort of a tease for these workshops we're doing this afternoon with, um, with the Placemaking US Network, which I'll introduce. Um, but we're leading with lovability and place can actually help achieve livability more affordably, more inclusively, and more quickly. Um, so that's been proven here, leading with a public space, leading with shared value, can, can, where shared value goes up at an exponential rate, also increasing and enabling private value. I think it has to be fundamental to how we address the big challenges that were discussed earlier around affordability, um, but doing this at scale. How is this project replicable um, you know, around the country, around the world? Um, really, really spectacular, the informality, the comfort, the sociability that we saw just, you know, just last night that's here really should be celebrated. These stories need to be told. Um, and, and it can be built on, too. How do you get more place and purpose and meaning and inclusivity in these public spaces as, as they evolve? And of course, the most informal of the spaces, the most um, the ones that you feel like you're co-creating being in them are to generate the most lovability um, and place attachment, which is increasingly a goal. So many people are coming to this focus of place and placemaking from many different disciplines, causes, um, sectors, you know, demographics, parts of the world. Um, and we see place as a way to sort of disrupt, break down silos, um, but also reconnect and ground the conversation in a more accessible, common sense way. Um, and each of these disciplines, each of the leaders of different causes of the environmental movement. Uh, my father actually organized the first Earth Day in 1970 in New York. Uh, so how do we, we're deep you know, into our heart is how do we get place to support the environmental movement, but it hasn't been about people and cities and places. So we, we see this as a way to bring many causes together. Um, of course, you know, the most egregious, we've all agree, of, of sort of solutions of how they're being applied narrowly is how cities have been de defined for and by cars and traffic. Um, but we think it's not about being against any of these solutions or disciplines or causes, but about how do we lead with people and places and the, the way people and places can build each other up. And how they, that, the, the, the attachment, the serendipity, the creativity that emerges when we focus on those two together, how they can draw the best out of many disciplines, causes. Um, Detroit's the city we've worked the most in and how the narrative has really shifted there to people locally and people moving there, feeling like they can be part of shaping the city, not just consuming it, but being co-creators of that space. So our work grew out of the work of William White, um, with the social life of small urban spaces, he said that it, it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. Of course, you know, just copying the form of a space fails. This is Piazza, uh, Piazza del Campo was uh, inspired Boston City Hall Plaza, but despite many design-based efforts to, to reinvent it, it hasn't worked. Um, so placemaking is something, a term we started using in the 90s uh, to sort of reflect what we'd learned in the previous 20 years uh, with Project for Public Spaces about moving to not just being experts in doing user analysis and uh, doing user-based activity, but um, uh, actually looking at the iterative process of how people and places build each other up. The connections, the, the process, as, as many people, as David Brain mentioned, is, is so important. So last year uh, with, with Michael, we, uh, we launched Placemaking X at the World Urban Forum um, after doing events with our regional networks all over the world. Uh, new nonprofit um, to build on the work of Project for Public Spaces, but really to highlight and apply the principle of the first pl principle of placemaking that the community is expert to the movement globally, to, to engage you and, and, and our networks all over the world to help define and further con you know, challenge and reinvent what placemaking is. We have strong roots, you know, with work and connections to Jane Jacobs and William White. Uh, my father founded PPS in 1975, um, but we started looking at it as a global movement uh, in the early 2000s and launched it in, in Detroit in 2013, and then a month later in, in Stockholm at the, at the Future of Places conferences. We, we were lucky to be able to connect Peter Elmond with UN Habitat to try to make public space and placemaking a global cause and include it in the urban agenda, which was all thanks to Michael's efforts to get that language in there. 
Uh, when we launched it, this was sort of the key message that, that everyone has the right to live in a great place, but more importantly, everyone has the right to contribute to making the place where they already live great. And we're not gonna create great places for everybody unless we really challenge and support everyone to be co-creators of these spaces and develop the right tools to do that efficiently and constructively. Uh, we've led, since led conferences all around the world, again, to define and shape local networks and the, the movement. Placemaking is defined differently all over the world, but it's being used in ways that actually keep each other in check and inform, inspire uh, each other globally. So there's strengths. It's coming from one sector, from one effort that sometimes is co-opting it a little bit. But one reason to network it globally is that it balances each other out it, and, it, and, and grows what it can be. So in the last year, we've really focused on strengthening and supporting the regional networks, uh, you know, of which there's all over the world, and there's new ones emerging in Cuba and Bhutan and uh, Nepal, and um, we just launched one in Japan, uh, and so forth. So the mission of Placemaking X is to be a global network of leaders who together will accelerate placemaking as a way to create healthy, inclusive, and beloved communities. We invite you to be part of it. Um, and I'm eager to discuss this afternoon how we can all best work together to advance our shared causes. As Seth Lowe said earlier, we're, 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 the challenge is we're, a lot of us are doing this alone. Um, there, all the knowledge is out there in a community, nationally, globally. We need to reorganize ourselves um, to be able to accelerate impact, uh, grow, grow learning, keep each other in check where we make mistakes. Uh, as as, as um, Andrew Rudd said, the biggest challenge, though, is to prevent people, other people from making the mistakes we've already made. So, uh, so we're trying to network the, the conversation and the movement, and we you know, look forward to doing this with you all and with, with IMCL. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Next up, we have Scott Martin from the organization World Urban Parks. All right, so um, this will be over-caffeinated, slightly manic, and way too fast, um, but there's too many slides, so I shall do my best. Let me hit the button first. Uh, we're going to talk about World Urban Parks and the National Park City Initiative, and what the important thing I want to leave you with when we start is we're not doing this. Um, I don't care if you have 2% body fat uh, and, and fit into an REI ad, because that's not the deal, and we're not talking about turning everywhere into Boulder, Colorado, as wonderful as that city may be. Uh, some of us live in the real world. What we are talking about is the value of wildlife and outdoor activities to the human soul everywhere you are, and possibly reconstructing the relationship we have when we think of cities and wildlife. And it's based on this image, really. The idea that urban wildlife isn't, isn't worthless, that people like critters deserve great habitat, cities can be enjoyable. And I think the key one for this audience is that, and there's a typo, um, people have profound power in cities to make these decisions and shape these outcomes in a way we don't have power, believe it or not, in places like Yellowstone. So that's the big concept here. A gentleman kind of tuned us into this about 100 years ago. Y'all may recognize that guy, Frederick Law Olmsted, who created that idea. And in the States in particular, we create a lot of great green spaces that built on this. You know, that y'all know that as Brooklyn Bridge Park, you know Millennium Park, certainly. Uh, here's a park from our colleagues over in Rotterdam. And from my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, here's Waterfront Park. But even though we built these parks, what we recognized and learned is that they weren't enough. We're watching extinction rates plummet. We're watching lack of fitness rates, our health rates, actually go the wrong direction. The next generation may have shorter lifespans than the present generation. So clearly this isn't enough. And the provocation I'm gonna leave you with today, because this is all about provoking thought, is that maybe we need to take a different approach. And it all came out of this guy's mind, Daniel Raven Ellison. If you do nothing else today, on your Twitter accounts and the Twitterverse, follow Dan because he's provoking us to rethink about cities and think about cities as habitat. This started in 2019, really, in full swing when London declared itself the world's first national park city. They pivoted, and the concept they took is everywhere you live in the city, not just the parks or the pretty stuff, everything is part of the city, and everything in the city is a park, and we reconstruct our relationship with land to that. So when you walk down the street, instead of just kind of being you know, unaware of what's going on, if you're here from India or my part of the world in Louisville, if you smell something weird right now, it's a black locust. You look up, you appreciate that. You may make room for beavers working across your street. That little bunny rabbit is depending on your city for home. Don't laugh at the quality of the picture. You try taking a picture of a peregrine falcon standing on a tree 100 feet off the ground, but 
these peregrine falcons require your communities for home as well. And there's all sorts of great constructs building around this, the we Rewild My Street initiative that many in this room, of course, are familiar with. But the idea is to take it even perhaps a step further. Instead of thinking about power line quarters as just infrastructure, what if they became gardens along and underneath those? Instead of just thinking of those gardens or farms as somewhere that we have out in the country, what if you put them on a rooftop? This is actually a rooftop farm in Melbourne, Australia. We're losing jungle, but instead of losing jungle, what if we replace jungle and we put really intentional green buildings into our cities? Not just thinking aesthetically, although aesthetics is important, but thinking about the habitat values as well. When we think about a forest, we think about urban forests, and it's always a cheat to put Jericondas out, but it makes a good picture. When we think about our transportation corridors, how frequently do we think about the impact those corridors have on wildlife? How about wildlife corridors? Y'all may know that because that's up in Banff. You can actually build these in your cities for smaller critters like flying squirrels, amphibians, rodents. But they start to have a force multiplier effect in terms of wildlife in your city. And just to give you a little uh, taste of, of what it means locally, these are critters found here in Indy um, and also in Louisville. These are neotropicals that rely on our cities for home right now. And they're sharing space with cities and with city residents. The concept is how do we make more room for them and more intentional contact. That's a paddlefish that lives in the Ohio River, the most commoditized, commercialized river probably in the United States of America. Wildlife. It is part of your experience. It makes the human experience better. And we think actually intentionally bringing you into contact with them makes for more livable and healthy cities. Rainbow darter. Y'all look at that fish and go, wow, it looks tropical. Uh -uh. That's a fish species that actually lives in the white and blue rivers here in the state of Indiana. And you hold one up, I'm gonna tell you right now, you can have a Tea Party member and a Green Party member in the same room, and suddenly you found a shared vocabulary upon which you can build communication and community. But it takes those moments that you wanna have. You say, that's great, Scott, what about wildlife? How about outdoor adventure? Well, we think outdoor adventure is a very important thing as well. And if you could Slip the slide, instead of going to West Virginia, maybe you do whitewater inside. Instead of going mountain biking out in the wilds, maybe you build urban mountain bike trails in your community. Instead of going hiking there, maybe you go hiking in the city. I will go really quickly now because I'm running out of time, um, but I encourage you that if you're inspired a little bit to think differently about your cities, uh, look up the National Park City Movement at nationalparkcity.org is just coming out. Adelaide just announced they're gonna be the second National Park City. Uh, that was announced yesterday. Galway in Ireland is on cue to be next. We understand that Sacramento may be the first city in the United States to take this leap. After that, we expect Calgary. And I have to wonder why it couldn't be a city like this that could take the leap as well and show that you don't have to be in some extraordinary geographic or coastal city to do it. You can make it special where you are. That's what I have. I hope you get a chance to look up the site. If you have any questions about this, I'd be more than happy to dial in with you or hit up Daniel as well on the Twitterverse. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Scott. You hit us with a lot of information and really hit the five minute mark. Uh, next up, we've got Madeline Spencer from Placemaking US. Come on out. Good afternoon. It's very great to be here at the first conference that I've ever attended. Um, okay. I'm starting out with Franco La Secla in Against Architecture tells us that the Bonlieu or the outskirts of France are discriminant. They represent a method of storage. They banish from the center a portion of the population considered less desirable. He asserts that this is key to understanding why the adolescent rage struck and damaged the cars within their own quarter. It was not just a wish for self-destruction, it was also a desire to physically cancel out the structures that held them away from the true city, those fences and barriers, those towers and squares that symbolize their being outside. La Secla also writes that the cities are an extraordinary background in which encounters with the unknown people and strangers form the basis for being able to invent the future. How do we begin to invent this future together? There's a cultural, um, Sci um, a social scientist, Dr. Eric Corrigan in Brussels, who stated that we are still of the belief that we live together in urbanity based on commonality, when it is actually on the basis of difference that we are brought together in our modern spaces. And what we learn from Corrigan is that it's no longer tradition, common history, identity, representative democracy, or continuity that will bond us in urban space. Rather, it's time to realize that when we work at discerning common roots as a foundation of national culture, we fail. 
We may have a common future, but our present is in no way common. Yet the present is where we must begin, and it requires what I believe is a radical imagination. Over the past seven years, I've lived in the city of Santa Ana, and Santa Ana is 300,000 people, 80% Latino majority city. This is a picture of the city, and I actually manage the downtown district. Um, in this time of working in the Business Improvement District in downtown, part of my job became the enactment and organization of space. And that work required me to work in urban tacticalism and the creation of circulations and flows within a series of downtown corridors, utilizing a series of different community engagement in interventions and strategies. And through this work, I began to see the space downtown in a completely different light. And I also began to see the relationship to the downtown, to its built environment, and to the city as a whole differently. One of the people who's informed this new understanding is an artist of light by the name of Olafur Eliasson. He recognized in his work that the cognition and physical organization of space also organizes movement. I have been captivated by how his art uses space to help individuals examine themselves. He has done this by creating an environment that assists people in tolerating their ability to see themselves within the space. The subtext of the space, he tells us, is whether we see ourselves as producers rather than consumers of space. Eliason asked two questions. How do we give authorship to people in the spaces and places that we're working within and how do we facilitate the production rather than the consumption of that space to occur. I recognize now that giving authorship to people in spaces and places is extremely important, not only for their health, but for the vitality and sustainability of our cities. So today I'm gonna to share two very quick stories that illustrate what I mean by consumption and production of space. The first story is about pain and alienation and resistance within the, this community that I'm in. And the second story is about space as an active affirmation of cultural production. So, the first story sorry, is about this plaza. And imagine you're a young Latino child living in the city of Santa Ana. Your parents immigrated when you were only two years old. They found an apartment that they share with two other families to make ends meet. Both of the parents work very hard from morning to evening. You go to school each day, you don't see them often. Yet on the weekends, one of the very favorite activities that you have with your family is to go to the street known as La Cuatro, where you regularly, regularly ride the carousel. Moments in this paseo have always created great one, and wonderful memories for you. Time passes, you're now a teenager, a sophomore in high school, and you notice something changing about the downtown the one that you once loved as a child. The space begins to feel less and less inviting. Benches where your parents sat to watch you in the Paseo disappear. The kiosk where you had your favorite Son Jarocho group perform is gone. The space used to hold these pivotal moments in place, but soon the carousel is ripped out. Um, your favorite store that had records is gone. You're trying to figure out why the area is changing. The facades are changing, the people in shops are changing, and a shocking sense comes over you that you and your family are no longer welcome downtown. And your friends give you this unfamiliar word which you've never heard. The word they tell you is gentrification. This is the new plaza. Um, the 15th century Italian philosopher Vico de Gabantista understood that our minds are actually made up of these fundamental places and images that have made a sensory impression upon our bodies. And I just wanted to show that the second story is about the community has been given the opportunity to actually utilize the downtown space to create a beautiful festival once a year, which is called Noche de Altares. So this is the opposite story, which shows us where that cultural production now reaches out to a region and, and has them enter into that festival. And I actually have a video that will just show the opposite um, display. <laughs>
I just showed you that to show you that if there's an opportunity for a community and groups of different cultures to be able to share their sense of place and space in communities, it can also help them to have the agency to become more connected to those spaces and to understand that they're welcome, which is one of the biggest things that you see um, happening. So that's all that I have. Thank you, Madeline. And now we have one more presentation before lunchtime. And that's the toughest spot of the whole day, I think. So welcome, Brian Henry. He's going to be presenting quality public outreach. Thank you. I know you're all hungry, so I'll be as brief as I can. So yesterday it was said that citizens shouldn't be treated like data points. Uh, I apologize to who said that. I forgot to write down your name. Uh, but I want to thank you because you uh, made me throw out my entire presentation today. Started over last night. I couldn't agree more, so let's go get lunch. <laughs> a key principle I have found in community outreach is a phrase from Theodore Roosevelt. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I just want to share two stories today of where I've seen this in action and the incredible result that it produced. The first one was the mayor of Provo, uh, the previous mayor of Provo, John Curtis. Now, I had never known who the mayor was. I had never cared in any city I'd ever lived in. But this man drew you in. He cared about the people. He was always at the events, the rooftop concert series. He was there. He was cheering on the bands. He wanted to make Provo cool again in a county that wasn't really known for being cool. Uh, and so he commissioned the Economic Development uh, Department to create the Provo Rocks t-shirts. They had no idea what a hit these shirts were going to be. They had a limited run of a thousand shirts. They were hoping they were going to get rid of them all. This spawned Facebook groups of people trading shirts, of people wanting shirts, paying money for shirts, trying to collect all 16. It made Provo cool again. I also encountered uh, Mayor Curtis at my child's preschool where he read a book to the children and then did something I've never seen anyone do. He asked the children what they wanted to see in their city and so many other ways. He had a blog where he actually left the comments on, which many people would think that was strange, but he wanted to know what the people really thought. I actually commented once on one of his blog posts and he invited me into his, his office to discuss further what I had commented on. I don't remember the comment, but I remember how that made me feel. It made me feel a part of my city. Mayor Curtis did amazing things in spite of very divisive public policy issues that happened. Uh, the biggest being the approval of the Utah Valley Express BRT system. It polarized the community. A lot of people didn't want it. And yet, with that approval, he was reelected with 86% of the vote in a city that is becoming more purple every year. My second story is about a, a woman who was a, a consultant hired for the city of Orem. She showed up for her first presentation, and instead of a PowerPoint, she stood up and asked questions. She wanted to know what the people wanted for the design corridor that Orem City was hoping to revitalize. She took all those comments and came back a few weeks later with drawings from Orem City and how these principles could be implemented to solve the problems that people had talked about. Suddenly, the comments weren't suspicious, but they were curious. The public was like, oh wait, so if we change like that, how is that gonna affect? And suddenly you saw a shift in that second meeting. And by the third meeting, she came back with revised drawings, implementing all sorts of principles of livable cities without ever having to talk about walk scores, without ever having to talk about ped sheds and all these jargon that we understand that the public doesn't. She presented her final presentation. When the presentation was over, the people clapped, but then they began to stand. This woman got a standing ovation in a public hearing. She was able to then move forward with these design changes. It passed through without the long line of people protesting the project at the city vote. She was able to build that trust in such a way that it was easy 
to implement livable city principles. She influenced me more than anyone else. I transformed the way I presented to cities and the way I helped developers to get their projects through. And it was, it was miraculous to watch. Nobody cares how much we know until they know how much we care. Thank you.